I'm Greg Wheatley, and my guests today on Inside Wheaton are two women who uh, make their home around here. One is a guest that has been here before. Dr. Len Koek is professor of New Testament. She's been here to talk with us about uh, some topics relating to women uh, in the world of the earliest Christians. In fact, that is her uh, the title of her earlier book. Len, it's great to welcome you back again. Nice to be here, Greg. Thank you. And uh, someone that I'm meeting for the first time, Dr. Amy Hughes, just earned her Ph.D. here last year at uh, Wheaton College in theology. I understand, Amy, the first woman to earn your Ph.D. in that department. Is that right? In theology, <laughs> yeah. yes. Well, yeah. congratulations to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the two of you are here because, um, Lynn, this is really a new book that the two of you are working on jointly, and it's kind of a follow-up to your earlier book on women in the early centuries, right? That's right, yes. Uh, my first book dealt with the world uh, that women navigated, whether they were Jewish or Gentile, in the Greco-Roman period. But this new book that Amy and I are working on is looking at Christian women in the second century up through the sixth centuries and how Christian women uh, lived their lives, especially how they integrated their faith uh, mm. with their daily lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, Amy, I know that, that this is right down the middle of what you did in your PhD work. Exactly. So this is a logical continuation. Tell me about, uh, about what you did in your doctoral work. Well, I did uh, historical theology with an emphasis in early Christianity, and I specifically focused on women in the Eastern tradition, third and fourth centuries, and their theological and philosophical contributions to mm. uh, theology, specifically Christology. Yeah, and I was seeing, just before I came in here, I was looking a little bit at your bio and, and some of the things, and the topic of um, the view of virginity back then as it related to, of all things, Christology. Yes, yes. And that's about all I could understand. So <laughs> it, enlighten me from there. What, what are you getting at? Well, what I'm getting at there is these women, and this, this is one of the impetuses behind this book as well, is that women didn't weren't at the councils. They didn't sign their names to things. They didn't have official ecclesiastical titles and often... We don't have very many documents that they even wrote by their own hand, mm. but they cons they really contributed significantly to the construction of theology in early Christianity by living devoted lives and by uh, working through a lot of these theological questions through letters, uh, through relationships that they had with um, family members who were bishops and, and all sorts of things. And one of the ways they did that was as virgins, it was an opportunity for mm. them to uh, live a full life of devotion. And through that sort of naturally came about a lot of theological uh, reflection. Mm -hmm. And uh, Is that, um, so the idea that a betrothal to Christ, is that, is that the idea as a virgin? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, eventually the idea is that you're, the way I characterize it is that virgins live into the resurrection. <laughs> the idea that uh, Everyone that Christianity believes in a bodily resurrection, but virginity was a way for you to reach out into that future union and sort of live it in the here and now. Bring yeah. the future into the now, right, yes. in some ways. Yes. So who are the two of you? Why this, uh, obviously, Len, because of your track record, I know your great interest in women of the early early centuries. Um, how did the two of you get together? I mean, maybe that's a, that's a place to start. Were you a student of Len's? We, uh, not in an official sense, but uh, we hung out. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. would say it was one of those serendipitous, hmm. uh, as, as just as we formed a relationship at, uh, through her grad school years, and um, she came and spoke at a class of mine. I have a class, um, Women in the Early Church, and she knocked it out of the park, hmm. and we realized, wow, we have a lot in common, and... Uh, just from there began kind of dreaming of of this project. So mm, That's great. Well, tell me about the project. It's a work in progress right now. In fact, I think you've got sort of a working title. Yeah. And uh, what is it? Christian Women in the, in the Patristic World, Authority, Power, and Legacy. All right, let's start with that P word, patristic. <laughs> People will want to know what that means. What, what does that mean? Uh, the church fathers, uh, the, the time in the church where a lot of the, the foundational theology of Christianity was okay. was built. Give us some names. They're, these are not necessarily household names, right? But well, Augustine. Augustine, Augustine is probably the closest know, to maybe household. Jerome. Tertullian, mm -hmm. uh, Gregory of Nazianzen, and, and this Chrysostom, John Chrysostom. There's some. 
So these are, this is the period following what you would have written on before. That's as correct. we move into the, what, second, third, That's fourth right. centuries, right? And whereas in the first book, I had to look at topics, um, marriage, uh, being a daughter, what kind of work did women do, really couldn't um, structure it chronologically because so many, th- there wasn't a lot of change lot happening. Of, yeah. uh, you know, um, the, the differences were often more in location, geographic and that sort of thing, or by religion if you were a Jew or a Gentile. But when you move into the Christian centuries, um, then you really have chronological development. So the first um, chapter that we'll be doing, looking at the second century, uh, that's when you have uh, the uh, you start to have the beginning of um, martyrs, the hmm. the stories of of martyrs um, begin to have um, a a sense of identity as a Christian that separates you from uh, either the Jewish community and also your Gentile pagan relatives. Hmm. And then you move into the third century, and that's where you have. Um, a strong presence of of martyrdom, um, but once you get to Constantine, <laughs> right, then, then that stops. But yeah. but still, women are very much a part of the growth of the church. We we are not, uh, as Amy and I like to say, we are not doing women's history. Mm. We are doing history and looking at particular figures who are women in the church's history. Tell me what we know about. Uh, in other words, what what do you look? What documents? are you looking at to come up with all of this? Are, are there a lot? Well, there's quite a few documents that we have of all sorts of different uh, different kinds. I mean, there's a lot of material, uh, inscriptions, and, and other things that we can look at that are like physical evidence that can tell us a lot about uh, life. And, and for instance, with one of the women that I'm working with uh, is Constantine's mother, Helena Augusta. Hmm. And one of the things that opens up her world to us is when she appears on official imperial coins and when she doesn't. It tells us a lot about what kind of authority that she had in the imperial court. So that's one example. And and then obviously we have written documentation. We have, uh, we have a few things that are uh, purportedly written by the women, Perpetua's diary, uh, a travel journal from the late fourth century. But most of it is written by men about women, Mm -hmm. uh, either telling their story or uh, talking about uh, virginity. It was a very hot topic (laughs) for men to write on in early Christianity. (laughs) So is it true that, you know, we we live in a day now where there's a lot said about, um, uh, in this postmodern world, about feminism and and whether women are being slighted, you know, the, the gender issues. Is it really true that if we could strip back and get behind all of that, that there would be many, many more women who were pivotal in that era than we know about? I mean, is that part of the problem, in other words? That, I think so. That we lived in a male-dominated... Um, well, I think so. And I think historians have perhaps unwittingly contributed to this by writing Christian history through looking at creeds. Mm-hmm. Um, or councils, mm. because because that's, they were created by men. Is that's that right, and the bishops were there, and but those bishops were listening to their sponsors, many of whom were women, and they were having dialogues, as Amy noted, letters sent back and forth, many of which we have, not necessarily those written by the women, but the responses by the men, and so women were were present, even if their bodies weren't actually there, their ideas were still represented. I think also I found this in looking at uh, the second century figure named Thecla, uh, found in the Acts of Paul in Thecla. For the next four or five hundred years, people are reading this story, and both men and women, and are choosing to become ascetic, to, we might say, rededicate their lives, Mm -hmm. um, based on her story. These are men and women doing this. So women served as models of piety, not just for other women, but for the whole church. Hmm. How many women do we know actually end up being martyred? Is there a good number of women martyrs? Well, the, the number of martyrs is, we have a lot of named ones, but then there's also, uh, in the documentation, we have a lot of, and this many people ah. were killed. Right. Um, so it's a bit of a matter of, for debate in some ways, mm-hmm. uh, but there are some but one way we can look at a lot of this material is to look at the stories that, that held fast in the church. Thecla is a really good example. There are several others as well of 
a national bestseller is probably the best mm. way to <laughs> everybody was reading. <laughs> everybody yeah. was reading yeah. Thecla. I mean, she, if she was today, she would have had uh, purses with her name on them, <laughs> uh, T-shirts, uh, you know, all sorts of things. She would have been quite the celebrity, and uh, even. And Gregory of Nazianzen, who presided over the Consul, Council of Constantinople, uh, he spent a good amount of time at her shrine mm. and, and spent time there uh, learning about her and being around that devotion. So um, she's one of many. So there wouldn't have been, and I, I try to frame this question correctly, um, there wouldn't have been a sense among those doing the martyring that they would spare women because no. of their womanhood. Uh, no. Hmm. No, what what you find is uh, there's an amazement by the crowd that women can withstand the kind of torture because uh, the understanding was that men had courage, manly courage, hmm. and bravery. That was a characteristic, a masculine characteristic, and to see that in women was quite amazing. Hmm. Uh, the same would hold true with slaves. And mm -hmm. so you have a very famous martyr, Blandina, who was both slave and woman. And the way the story is portrayed, uh, at the end, uh, bef as she, in a sense, takes her last breath, her, her arms are stretched out. And some believe she's, in a sense, standing there as the Christ figure on the cross, mm. um, just in one uh, with the suffering of her Lord. And so there, it was a very powerful image. It's not that there were... Uh, martyrs being slaughtered every week uh, constantly. In fact, it was sporadic and local. Mm -hmm. But Christians drew from these uh, and also promoted the martyr as a way to really understand what it meant to be a Christian. I see, right. What about um, women in positions of leadership? I'm assuming that th that was seen from Paul's letters to not be an option for women or or does that change through the centuries? Or? It doesn't change. Uh, I don't think it changes much from the New Testament. What you have in the New Testament is women having roles of authority and, and uh, being very important in the life of the church, even at the level of teaching, even at the level of apostle where you have Junia from um, the end of Romans there. So you have women very involved. When you get into the second century and you start to have offices in the church, such as bishop, there, at this point, we have no evidence that a woman held the role of bishop, mm -hmm. although perhaps the role of elder, that's uh, contested, and certainly as deacon. But, you, but the role of virgin is a very powerful role. Mm -hmm. And so the virgin could actually have more authority than a married man. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you see, it's difficult. We, it's hard for us. We shouldn't necessarily lay our own uh, church's ordination processes back on We tend to, to read backwards into We that. do. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, and with, and this with, with this as well, with authority, I think it's, we have to be careful with what we uh, ascribe as formal authority. Mm -hmm. Because one of the reasons we have the shifts of bishops in the more structured church is because of the church spread. And if you were a Roman, what did you look at in order mm -hmm. to model your administration off of. You looked at the, the administration of the Roman Empire, right, and right. so it mimics a lot of the Roman structure of governance. So it makes sense in that way. Um, but as Lynn just said about, uh, there was always in Christianity, there's always this push <laughs> for uh, people of faith to display their gifts and to uh, live their lives of devotion in free will and in, in uh, in the way that they knew how. And so you have all of these uh, explosions of, of devotion that don't fit within a, hmm. ca a normal category mm -hmm. of, uh, of how one would fit within a specific does, structure. Does your, does your book also look at everyday life? I know your earlier book did that. Uh, or is this more focused on church life? Um, you're looking at what women were doing in the everyday life as well in these centuries? Yes, as it pertains to what uh, Christian women did. So not so much what was happening as a general history, um, but more what would Christian women be doing. So we would spend much more time looking at religious practices than I did in the first book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, let's bring this up to date. Um, 
everybody wants a practical application, right? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? What do you walk away with? You're doing all this study. Has this uh, has this changed the way you think about anything today? Well, I'll tell you, I'm currently very much uh, looking at martyrdom. Um, because that was an experience in the second and third centuries that Christians talked a lot about. And you get the sense that they were preparing themselves um, for that possibility. Well, I mean, it's terrible to say, but today there are also Christians who are being martyred. Mm -hmm. And so I've thought about how do I, in the United States, as a, as a Christian, understand what's happening to my brothers and sisters uh, in other parts of the globe. Can the testimony of these early martyrs help? And I think it does. It helps in a couple of ways. These early martyrs truly believed in the bodily resurrection, as Amy has said. This, this was, that was the centerpiece. And perhaps that conviction can um, help us today in the United States say to our neighbors who are also wondering about the barbarity and what's happening to other Christians to say, to testify that their bodies will be raised. Yeah. Um, and I think also these early Christians spoke strongly against the domination of brute force that the Romans did to criminals, did to slaves, and did to Christians. And the Christian stance against that, saying you can kill the body, but you're not, yeah. you, don't have, you don't have the last say, I think again speaks perhaps into our world that might have a tendency to want to use brute force, maybe even to fight back against, yeah. use force against force. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I actually think that this book could have some interesting applications as we think about their testimony and the situations that we or others... And we have face. sort of lost... I mean, we say we believe it in theory, but on a practical level, we don't sometimes really believe what we believe about the bodily resurrection, do we? I mean, right. we kind of have this sense of disembodied forever, but to, to really believe that this body is going to be resurrected, that, uh, that's pretty radical, isn't it? Yes, it, it absolutely is. And... I to go along with what Lynn was saying about you know, things that have come up with as a result of working on this book. I, one of the reasons I got inter interested in working with virgins in early Christianity, you know, it's not something you just automatically think, oh, that's an interesting <laughs> right. idea. Uh, I had a young woman come up to me in my little urban church, and she was about 23 or 24 at the time. And she asked me, you know, what, what do I do? As, what is my part as a single mm. woman? in the church. Mm -hmm. And that th that just really struck me because I realized that we have to tell these women's stories because uh, evangelicals, we like to sort of skip over a lot of history. But these are our ancestors <laughs> right. in the faith. They're, right. they're our stories and we can access those, uh, their, uh, their devotion and their stories for, yeah. to encourage us. When do we look for this book? Oh, well, within the next probably 18 months or so, we'll be finishing writing it this year. And then, then we turn it to the publisher. And, uh, <laughs> right. And then who knows? <laughs> and then who knows? Uh, bets but, are off. Uh, <laughs> Do you have a publisher? Or yes. Okay. Yes. Baker Academic. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Well, it's great to have the two of you here. Thank you so much Thank for you, your Greg. work yeah, on this. You. And uh, we'll have to have you back and maybe after the book comes out and we'll, we'll talk some more. Dr. Lynn Coick, professor of New Testament here at Wheaton College and Dr. Amy Hughes, who is a recent Ph.D. graduate uh, last year under the Dale and Susan Kemp Fellowship. For more information, get in touch with us here, and uh, we'll put you in touch with these people if you'd like. For Inside Wheaton, I'm Greg Wheatley.